so we get both Jeremy and Ben as we sit down with uh, both of them for an interview at the CPC, the Center for Palliative Care. And uh, what a duo. These guys really uh, couldn't be different, uh, and they are the perfect pairing for what they're doing uh, over there. So sit back, relax, enjoy. Okay, so I am at the CPC. And both Ben and Jeremy are here. So, hi, this is Ben Reagan. And I'm Jeremy Kaufman. And uh, immediately, uh, we need to know if there's any relation. No, not currently. Not currently. Interesting. So, you know, <laughs> lineage wise, there's always a shot. Yeah. Well, you know, you go back far enough, you might as well just be brothers. Pretty so. much. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. We're all related if yeah. you look at it that way. Yeah. Fair enough. But as you uh, tread upon the earth, uh, not today kind not of today, thing. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, CPC, you guys are doing some pretty unbelievable stuff. Uh, I was just talking to you about my friend that has Crohn's, my friend that has MS, my uh, other friend that kind of has back achy type things. Uh, and you guys are all about kind of helping patients. Uh, most definitely. Um, with a range of available products, there's a lot of conditions we can treat um, and a lot oh. of things we can help uh, people do so they can live their lives. And while Ben's doing that, not that you're not, you're, uh, you're kind of helping sort out some legislation for us, Jeremy. Is that, that about right? Yeah, I have the fortunate uh, ability to focus on that side of the business while Ben does the R&D and product development. And, and it does uh, point out the fact that um, while uh, both of you are, are wonderful people, uh, there is not a lot of similarity here. You know, the, <laughs> the, Venn, the Venn diagram really doesn't overlap too much. So let's kind of get into some history. Jeremy, you know, um, you, you've certainly had a relationship with the plant for a while, right? So to get into that. Um, yeah, I found cannabis worked really, really well for um, ADHD and depression in the late 90s. Uh, and then using it as a means to survive myself through college, uh, broke my neck snowboarding in the early 2000s, got addicted to opiates and then found that cannabinoid content worked really, really well for all the conditions I was dealing with, having a titanium rod, pulling a bunch of vertebrae together. Um, and then, so that kind of started that journey. And then in 2007 or eight, Ben and I kind of got together and started powwowing. And then in 2009, the CPC really became a, a real place. And it's uh, the Center for Palliative Care is what it stands for. And palliative really is the treatment of, of any symptom that a condition creates. And cannabis having, you know, at this point, hundreds to thousands of compounds on any given strain, you're dealing with uh, an incredible range of compounds that create palliative function for the human body. So we're going to get into the 2009 and, and beyond. Um, you literally broke your neck? Yes. I smashed into a tree snowboarding. Uh, were you a, a decent snowboarder and that was just a little bit of bad luck? Yes. Because right. yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you. I feel like you know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah it was bad life. It was a bad day. All right. So you break your neck yeah. and uh, they kind of put you back together and then uh, dump you onto all sorts of what? What What? what did they put you on med medicine one? Uh, Oxycontin, fentanyl, diazepam, uh, mood stabilizers, antidepressants. I mean, the concoction, you know, any day was between 400 and 800 milligrams, depending on you know, what the condition I was dealing with that day and how severe it was. Uh, so um, in the hospital, how long were you in the hospital? About a week. Okay. And then how long were you taking that type of uh, concoction after leaving the hospital? Uh, rehab took me about two years. Okay. And so over that two-year period, when did you kind of say, or, or how did it come to be that you were on kind of all that and then you weren't? Uh, I actually became suicidal and ended up in rehab and a friend of mine who just kind of handed me a brownie and was like, Hey, this will work. And I was like, it's garbage. I used to smoke that stuff for ADHD and stuff, but it doesn't really work for pain. And, uh, then it, it worked and then we kind of became, well, I can transfer two bites of brownie for 10 milligrams of methadone. And then you realize there's a system and I'm a systems analyst by trade. It's actually what I learned in college. Um, so then it became my life's pursuit to really figure out how to systematically get cannabinoids into the human body in an effective way to, to deal with the classic conditions that humans deal with. So you, you, uh, had dealt with ADHD, uh, ADHD and, uh, had success with that. And then, uh, didn't understand uh, what the kind of pain relief, 
uh, you know, options were, and then obvious that became obvious to you, and then you wanted to spread the word. Where along that path did uh, Ben come in? I uh, Ben, I don't have the science mind. Like, that's really it. Like, I, I don't, I mean, I knew that you could make these products. I knew they existed from a systematic standpoint, but the reality to sit down and, and really make them was, was totally beyond the, 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 the structure skill sets that I have. So Ben has this crazy brain that you just, you can't match. You can't like, I, I stopped arguing with him years ago. Like he, he, <laughs> he remembers a huge majority of what he reads and what he, what he sees and what you tell him. So when he really like goes to work on understanding a product or process, he, he just anything he reads that adds to that knowledge base, he doesn't forget. So after months and months of researching a process where most people have to reread something time and time again to become a PhD level person year after year, he can he can. It's just insane. So, yeah, I'll let him. Yeah, yeah I love that. He stopped. You stopped arguing with him <laughs> yeah. many years ago. You said, no, OK, unless, unless I know I'm right, unless yeah. I can like actually yeah. go yeah. to the article right. or like I'd be like, no, I know this is legit. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, exactly. Yeah. Like it's it's actually one of my tattoos. So yeah, it's exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah, it's literally on my body. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So then uh, where does that brain develop? Where I mean, you're from Washington, right? Uh, yeah, I grew up in Oak Harbor uh, from second grade on, military uh, brat. Okay, military brat. I did ask you if you're a scientist. You say you're not a scientist. <laughs> uh, Jeremy says you have a scientific brain. Bridge the dots for us. Um, I would say researcher. Okay. Like, to be able to take to find data, take it in, and to be able to apply that data in a larger scope, um, I think a lot of it's that research side. Um, we're very fortunate here that I get to work with people one-on-one -on -one as far as our community members and patients go. So that constant bounce back and forth too is one of those honing in the things, you know, yeah. um, for that. So. And, and so that research mind, uh, you know, uh, high school, okay, fine. What was your major in college? Um, I didn't go to college. Okay. I'm actually, so then, so I'm, yeah. I'm pretty much all self-trained for most of the stuff I do. All right. So you didn't go to college. Uh, in high school, what subjects uh, were, you know, easier for you? Um, science and math. Okay. Yeah. So science and math. So you do have the science and math mind. As Jeremy says, uh, you are not a scientist because you stopped schooling. Because I didn't, yeah, I didn't go and get the school. So I don't count myself as a scientist. Yeah. Got it. And why the choice not to uh, go to college? Um, at the time, it just didn't work out for me. Um, I followed a, a girlfriend down to Seattle at the time um, and ended up living down here and just working. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty fortunate in the places I've worked because I've done computers a long time. Um, and for a while, I was an AVP at Washington Mutual for the lawyer legal department. Um, so we tend to be, I tend to get in pretty high level positions yeah. um, as far as that stuff goes. Yeah. Well, because the guy that knows the computers, let's keep, uh, you know, <laughs> pushing him up the, the ladder there. Right. And I do have an ability to explain things to people in a normal fashion, too. So it's kind of that, that tech brain that's bridged with the ability to actually talk to real folks and stuff like that that yeah. I think helps. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, Washington Mutual and uh, Chase come together and uh, leave Ben out of that equation. And then what, you know, where does uh, Jeremy come into the picture from your perspective? Um, so for me, uh, like my introduction into cannabis was helping my dad out with some old uh, Navy injuries and stuff he has so we can actually eat food. Um, that was kind of my introduction to the medical side. And then I think I was talking to Jeremy one day and he was mentioning having to go back to work in finance and how much he didn't want to have to do that. And it was like, oh, I mean, we could always maybe start a dispensary or something. Yeah, we probably could. And I think we bounced the idea around for a couple months. Um, before really getting serious about it. So. And, and that time period is around 2009? Uh, 2008, yeah. I think, or so, because it took us a while to get things organized or to figure out how to do it correctly mm -hmm. um, and get caught up. So. All right. So, but let's let's talk about your uh, dad and how you kind of found the right treatment for him. You know, start at the beginning. So um, how it began is I was up there for 4th of July and my uh, stepmom turns to me and goes, hey, your dad's not eating. He has to throw up after he eats. So he basically just subsists on coffee syrups all day uh, through coffee, which isn't good when you have a family history of diabetes, right? So um, they were like, do you have any cannabis you could try? I was like, well, yeah, I got some in my car. And they're like, aren't you on a break? I was like, on a break? I'm on vacation now. I just got laid off. <laughs> so I go out to the car and I grab some cannabis and I come back um, and we smoke a bowl together. Um, and literally 30 minutes later, he's able to eat a sandwich and hold it down. So um, that was kind of the build in for that. Um, and then from there, we started developing like the teacher products um, that we carry and stuff like that. So it was kind of that introduction and then to figure out how to deliver it to him where he wouldn't have to smoke, um, I think became a big one after that. Yeah. And so so there you have it. I mean, just with the two of you, you have three different applications of the plan. You've got ADHD, you've got uh, pain relief, and then, you know, you've got appetite development. Yeah. Right. So. Is that why I know that uh, when I think of the CPC, I see a capsule? 
Um, most definitely. <laughs> that is definitely why. Uh, we're lucky enough to really be on top of that one. Um, and we do supply quite a few patients in the state with capsules. And Well, that's a, it's a funny story. Like I kind of like going on with Ben said, like I being in rehab and doing all that, I was, I was living in Australia and this is about, yeah, like 2005. And that's what the vision was. Like, it was like, okay, if I'm on pills and I can take a brownie, then this can be in a pill like that. And that's where I'm talking, like mm. the ability to, so I, for years, like I just, there was no way to really make it happen without Ben. Like that was really the concept. Mm -hmm. and, it, and even, even when we started, it was hard to get people in, in our own company to like get on board with the idea that we're going to put cannabis in pills, yeah. you know, like yeah. that was revolutionary back when we started. Totally. And I would imagine there was a pushback because let's respect the flower. And, you know, your point of view would be, no, we, we are respecting That's, the flower. Yeah. You know, um, uh, considerably we, you know, uh, we make sure that the effect of the flower shows up in the end product. So when people take this capsule, it will have the same effect as if they were smoking that original flower. So, and that was a hard part to make sure that end piece shows up in there without having to um, add a bunch of stuff to create an effect. And I, uh, let's just kind of go down the line here. You know, I uh, talked to you about my friend who has Crohn's and, um, you know, we were looking at your kind of product line and you uh, pointed out a few that did make sense. Just take us through that because I, I found it fascinating that you immediately know exactly what to uh, prescribe. Well, a lot of the research and working one-on-one -on -one with community members has allowed us to build kind of a good brain trust and knowledge around that. Um, and thankfully, there's a lot of research data that's showing up. So when you come in for Crohn's or IBS, um, a lot of times we look towards the CBD products. Um, CBD has been shown to help uh, reduce Crohn's as well as inflammation in that area. Um, and then we find pairing it with a little bit of THC um, and that one-to-one -one ratio just has the greatest effect overall. Um, THC does play a pretty big role, um, we find, in a lot of the pain relief aspect um, and actually making CBD more effective. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about CBD is it keeps THC from being so psychoactive and it mm -hmm. kind of balances that guy out. So they really do work well and well together. Well, um, it, yeah, and it is, uh, you know, in concert that uh, really does, you know, uh, kind of showcase both. And, you know, what are your thoughts on states that are kind of passing legislation that is CBD only, you know, that uh, eliminates THC? I don't know how much you're looking at other states' legislation besides Washington. Yeah, I mean, we we I don't. There's an estate that I don't think we really know about. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, uh, cannabis is 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 uh, awesomely enough, or sadly enough, is really all that we do. Um, mm -hmm. So it gives us a lot of time to focus on just cannabis. So internationally, nationally, mm -hmm. um, I mean, honestly, to pass state legislation like that is it's it's an abomination. Like it's an atrocity. Like you, this plant. It's it's full product and purposes come from having access to the profile. It's not. I mean, we have this really rudimentary understanding and, and now the CBD is the new buzzword. That's what everyone's hooked on. And then six months from now, it'll be something else mm -hmm. and something else. When in reality, five years from now, people will understand its ratios, that it's a seven to one to four to three to two ratio of THCA to THCB to CBD to CBG mm -hmm. that works really, really well for MS or a six to one. To, you know, they will uh, they will figure all this stuff out when you have mm -hmm. terpenes, terpenoids, flavonoids, endoflavonoids, cannabinoids, you know, I mean all these classes of compounds, all these subsets of compounds that interact, like what Ben was saying earlier, that mm -hmm. when you, the, what, what I really appreciate about him as a partner is that I've never had to argue with him, A, first and foremost, about how altruistic we run the company and B, the quality of the product mm -hmm. that will never dilute the quality to make more product. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we have to be able to find a way to make the same quality product and make more of it. But that's because that ratio is so important that when, we were running through rudimentary extraction methods and they're only giving you 50% or 60% of the profile of that original plant. Mm -hmm. It's not as effective. Whereas if you can get 80 to 90% of that profile transitioned through to the end product. Mm -hmm. It has that, that synergistic effect is exponential for the end user. And that's our goal. The, the, the entourage effect, if yes. you will. Right. And uh, of course you do uh, <laughs> here at the CPC. Um, but uh, you know, what about, um, you know, if we are going to put in legislation in certain states, it's uh, CBD specific. What are your thoughts on uh, schedule uh, one and rescheduling versus descheduling and all that? Where's your mind space at? Descheduling. I mean, that's this the only I mean, this is a botanical plant. The, the I mean, this is a, this was a right of the people. When you think about, you know, our forefathers and even before that, that the cannabis and hemp have been used 
by the human race for thousands of years without having to have these intense sanctions. I mean, this is a this is a non-processed plant. It grows like this naturally. It's built like this. Humans are built like this from the same system. We have a symbiotic relationship with each other. So mm-hmm. it is for states that are passing narrow-minded legislation like that. I mean, it's good. It's it's three steps forward, two and three quarter steps back. You know, you're getting that 0.25 <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but that eventually is a wedge that people will will hammer in 20 years from now. Hopefully you'll have a society that, that really celebrates the fact that we have these plants that are so beneficial to us. And, um, and I would kind of add to that um, a lot of the CBD products that don't have THC that you can buy online and stuff do have THC in them. Mm-hmm. I've purchased these products and seen them tested and most of them test two to three times the amount of THC um, that's supposed to be in the bottle. Mm-hmm. And I think when people take these products, that's where a lot of that benefit shows up from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I encourage people, anything seven days, past that, it's no longer placebo effect. It has to be working for it to be you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of that piece. So for us, even in our products, like we have to have people try it for two weeks because it always works the first five, seven days. It's just how the human brain works. Huh. Yeah. If, well, I that- tell you, if I tell you it works, yeah. you will have it work for the first couple of times. It's really interesting. But, but then eventually you stop convincing yourself it works and the actual effect has to show up. So oh. give it two weeks type of thing. Yeah. You know, you should be taking something that long, you know. Yeah. And uh, that, that's how I quit cigarettes, right? You got to get past the yeah. uh, through the first two weeks. Yeah, 28 yeah. days, That's man. the hump. You got to get over the hump. Yeah, yeah. And, and I will add, too, for some of these products, like without Jeremy here driving um, a lot of our mission and stuff, um, I definitely wouldn't have time to do things like make the pills and stuff like that. And a lot of those things do come born out of our partnership and stuff, mm-hmm. um, especially when we see that he notices deficiencies in the community. And he's like, we should make this. I'm like, yeah, we totally should. Dude. That's a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, because it definitely is uh, definitely a partnership when it comes to making things around here. Yeah, yeah. no, totally. I, uh, I knew that walking in, but I can see it plainly uh, true today. Um, I want to do three final questions. Um, and we'll do uh, one for you, one for you, and then the third one for both. Uh, the first one is what has most surprised you in cannabis? And I'm actually going to ask Ben that question because I'm going to ask Jeremy what has most surprised you in life because it's going to involve cannabis in the answer anyway. And uh, then the third and final question for both of you is on your soundtracks, your respective soundtracks of life, uh, give us one track, right? So we always like to kind of finish with those. So what has most surprised you in cannabis, Ben? Um, what's really most surprised me in cannabis is, I guess, the acceptance um, that has really shown up in uh, generations of people that you didn't think would use cannabis. Um, I have helped people in their 70s use cannabis whose children brought them in and swore they would never use it. Um, but now that they have to deal with a new pain that's there or a new symptom, um, they want to give it a try. So um, the, the, for me, that's sort of the biggest change uh, to see this generation that has been uh, ham roted about how horrible cannabis is to finally willing to accept it as a choice, mm-hmm. um, I think is really powerful. Um, it definitely uh, the mm-hmm. couple thing, other thing that surprises me, too, is just how much uh, money people think cannabis actually generate <laughs> yep um, <laughs> unless unless you are literally raking the end user unless you're literally raking the end user um it's hard to make good money in cannabis um i usually recommend for people if they want to make good money go get a software programming degree and grow cannabis in your closet and you'll make good money in cannabis because that's <laughs> the easiest way to do it uh going forward so i would yeah um that's kind of the thing that surprised me too was how fast everybody jumped in and then they're just like man dude you guys kind of falling off the wall now that you spent all this money because yeah. it really wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a gold rush. It yeah. really wasn't like that. And uh, it's tougher uh, and there's a lot more involved and there's a lot of competition and there's all of these regulations, of course. So, uh, well, thank you for that answer. Uh, Jeremy, what has most surprised you in life? <laughs> uh, <laughs> My yeah, seriously, that was the, pretty, pretty much that. Yeah, can I leave it at that? Um, I'm, I hate to say it. I'm, I'm trying to find something like positive. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, dude, listen, dude, we're dude here. Politics, unfortunately, doesn't leave you a lot of. Like, I came into the industry really, really happy and, and optimistic about life and the human race and cannabis and hemp's ability to persevere. <laughs> the last, I think, 15 years, I've just been. But but what I will say, okay, what is actually fairly surprising is, from a systems analyst standpoint, I came back from a beautiful life overseas to with this fire in my belly, like Ben said, like there, I just, there was this thing that wouldn't, no matter how fun, much, I mean, a good time I was having, there was this thing in me that was like, you have to do this. And, um, systematically 
what I understand about people and, and everything else like that, it's, it's been really fascinating to see Ben and I navigate this industry and how to deal with opening Washington State's first legal cannabis dispensary in 2009. I mean, front door, business license, paying taxes. What surprised me is I thought it was going to be 20 years before you saw a major legalization push and it's happening in like eight, which so that is so I mean, you're looking at, I think, major federal restructure of the drug policy in the next 10 years, which which is that pretty freaking surprising compared to where we started. And I'm glad that you can kind of stick your head up and and see that that is closer than you initially anticipated, even though every day is a dog fight. (laughs) That's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. 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 All right. So, uh, you know, tracks, let's do it. Songs on your soundtrack of life. Name at least one. Uh, Bingo players mode. Oh, wow. Um, Martin Garrix animals. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't think I know. uh, I'm not familiar. I'd recommend it. They're good uh, electronic music. There we go. Okay, that's uh, that's me. Jeremy's trying to get some some inspiration. I yeah, think. there's. All right, this is. Oh, the, you're just gonna play. No, it no, no I was gonna play it, but I, you know, I don't know if it's gonna show up on the thing. But this is uh, a song that I just found. I'm, I'm. I was gonna say the theme song to Lawrence Welk. I was uh-huh. raised. I was a lot. You know, it's it's a <laughs> good night. Yeah. And and you know now it's it's kind of full circle. I was raising my grandmother. Now my grandmother uses our product. She's like ninety five years old. And it's amazing. Um, but this this song is called "Happy Day from Me to You" um, by Sir Victor Uefo, uh, and it's uh, from I think nineteen seventy three. And it's just the guy. It's it's the song is called "Happy Day," you know, and he's wishing a happy day to everybody in the audience and peace and prosperity and. Amidst all the chaos that is politics that I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm a fairly positive person and it's been hard the last seven months. This session was brutal and it's been hard for me to maintain my positive outlook on life. So when I found this song a couple months ago and I remember having a rough day, I play it and it, it just reminds me of like the simple concept of what I'm supposed to focus on. All right. So if you're listening, go find that right now. Ben, Jeremy, thank you so much. Let's listen to that song as soon as I press stop. How about that? All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> Two of the nicest guys in cannabis. Although the uh, industry is blessed to have some uh, very kind souls, of course, there's uh, every kind of person in the cannabis industry. But Jeremy and Ben, again, uh, two of the more special guys. So uh, we appreciate their time uh, and everything they're doing uh, over at the CPC. 